Greetings. Welcome to ITR Live. I'm your host, Chris Hagan, and welcome back to another action-packed, fun-filled episode of Iowa's most technolo- technologically challenged conservative podcast. <laughs> And uh, and pronunciation challenged, and it's bad. I should start over, but we're not going to. Uh, John and I are here, um, and we've got something a little different today. Uh, we are going to do a, a recap of the ITR NFIB Tax Day Luncheon, which was yesterday in Des Moines. So it was it was a good event. We had three speakers that came. Uh, we had. House Ways and Means Chairman Bobby Kaufman. We had the Director of the Departments of Management and Revenue, former House Speaker Craig Paulson, and uh, Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitver, a former guest on the ITR Live podcast. So, Don, did you have fun? It was. It was a fun event, and uh, a lot of people turned out, even with the the uncertainty of the weather. And right. so it, the lunch was good, and... And so I thought it went really well. Yeah, I, w- I was. I think we were all pleased at how it turned out. And it's you know, anytime you put on an event, you always worry that you got all the details ironed mm-hmm. out. And I and I think we accomplished that part. Yes, and, yeah. And that, which which worked out well. And but what was really fun is I thought all of the speakers were great. Yes, and they were on point. And yes, each speaker had something really meaningful to say. But underlying all that, it's a theme I want to come back to as we kind of talk through this, John, is that you can kind of see how this all fits together. And we have talked a lot about how Iowa is so successful and done all these things, and it doesn't happen by accident, is that these folks are all working together to get all these things done. And and so we had a chance to sort of see it. You had someone from the House, someone from the Senate, someone from the executive branch, and, and to get that get that sense from them. So when I say technologically challenged, John, (laughs) um, we've got, I'm going to try and uh, play a few clips. So we're going to, we're going to try and do a highlight show here on this. But um, the first off is we don't have Chris with us today. And Chris uh, sort of kicked off the event with, uh, with just some comments. And he said something that I, that I enjoyed about why we do all of this. So I'm going to try and play that and then we will uh, we'll come back and and see. Iowa is really important to me. OK, my roots are here. I mean, I went through the same school system as my parents and my grandparents. Now, my wife and I are choosing to make our home here in Iowa. We have four kids and we hope our state can provide them everything they're going to need. And I think most of you in this room care really deeply about Iowa, too, because your community is is likely part of who you are, right? So maybe you're looking out for the future of your business, or maybe you're thinking about the next generation or two of your family. But no matter why we all care, uh, the fact is we're all concerned about what's next for Iowa. So that was sort of kick it off. And John, we don't just do this. Well, maybe we do some of it because we you know, want to have more money in our pocket at the end of the day. Yes. It's sort of in our mission statement. But the real reason is because it's better for Iowa. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's encouraging, you know, kind of a reminder you know, of the why we do what we do part yeah, of this. So. I think that's right. And what, what Chris said is a reminder that, that uh, you know, policy has consequences, whether it's good or bad. And, and uh, thankfully, we've seen fairly good policies in the last several years uh, at the state level here in Iowa. And and it is. It's about having good communities. And if you look at some of the things that are going on nationwide in different states and communities, whether it's, uh, you know, the fiscal mess of some states or the high crime rates, it, it's, it, it comes back to, you know, what what is behind those ideas, those policies that are being implemented. And what kind of a state and community are we going to have as a result of it? Yeah. Um, The first speaker was uh, Representative Bobby Kaufman, who is the new this year chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He'd been chairman of the state government committee. And I have a couple clips from him today. But the first was we talked in, in multiple episodes, John, about the bill that went through the legislature to correct 
the calculation of the residential rollback. So again, we're not going to go back into all the terminology of property taxes again, but he talked a little bit about his experience in getting that bill to the floor and, and on passage. And, and I think it's kind of interesting to hear in, in Bobby's own way, I'm sorry, Representative Kaufman. It's hard. I, I served with all three of <laughs> yeah. these people. And so, I, I yes. So, Representative Kaufman, Mr. Chairman, uh, here's your first clip. Then when we debated the assessment bill last week, and all that was was a correction. And as far as I'm concerned, what was happening with the lobbying up at the Capitol was lobbying malpractice. The cities have more money in their reserve accounts than the state of Iowa. And so, as I was passing this legislation, I was having good people, law enforcement, good people coming before us and being told to say that if we didn't, if we did this, there was going to be a drastic cuts, defund the police and all sorts of other stuff that I'll only be politically correct and call it BS. And we were able to push through that. We were able to pass that. And we were able to save you from a hundred and thirty two million dollar residential property tax increase. So I know this was this was an important part of getting this bill passed is cities went all in to try and continue to reap the reward of the calculation the way it had originally been done. And it would have been an even bigger windfall than they already got. So they sent police and fire up to the Capitol to say that this bill would, would cut those services. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's, and we see that even at the federal level, the best way to scare people is to say, you know, if you cut spending or, we're not going to get the increase we want or if something like this happens, they're always going to say, well, EMS is going, police is going, fire is going or other essential services. And, and thankfully the legislature saw through that. And, and, uh, and like, uh, chairman Kaufman said, this was a fix. Uh, and it, it basically, uh, was not, it was something that was done that should have been done in favor of the taxpayer. Right. And, and the cities are, are just, uh, I mean, they're complaining because they're, they want money. I mean, just, and, um, that, that's the other thing we've talked about a lot on this, on this program is that, you know, the, it gets to the heart of it where, you know, the, the, the cities have to, there needs to be a break applied their spending. And just like your experience, when you were on the zoom, for one of the, I think it might have been that bill hearing on the Senate oh, side, yeah. mm -hmm. when you had, I don't know the, how many how many lobbyists were there, taxpayer funded yeah. lobbyists uh, again, that yes, were on there. Yes. I mean that was that was well, incredible. <laughs> well, I think it, and talking about how this fits together, um, when we have a clip later from uh, Leader Whitver, he sort of comes back around on the same idea that Representative Kaufman's talking about that. And John, you mentioned the scare tactic, but it is, although this is Representative Kaufman's first year as chairing that Ways and Means Committee, he is a, an experienced legislator. Mm -hmm. And this is where the experience of having been through these situations comes through, is that they've seen the arguments, they've been through it, and they actually know their local people and can talk directly to them. And, and kudos to Chairman Kaufman for seeing through it and understanding the actual numbers, which we worked really hard to try and provide yes, as well yeah. here of what those numbers are, and and was able to work through that and get the right piece of policy done to deliver a hundred and thirty four million dollar or prevent a hundred and thirty four million dollar property tax increase to Iowans. So, um, more thematically, uh, Chairman Kaufman mentions a little bit about where he sees the Ways and Means Committee going from here, which is also really encouraging. So I'm going to play that now. We've been able to achieve some tax successes, getting our income tax rate down to 3.9% in a couple of years, and making sure that our corporate taxes are lowered, as well as ensuring, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as ensuring that retirement income is not taxed. Those were all big deals, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop there with me as far as Ways and Means is concerned. So, and I know we're going to hear in a few minutes from leader Whitver on this, but getting a 3.9% doesn't stop there. No. And it, and, and I, and I'm assuming that, that chairman Kaufman means property taxes, income taxes, corporate taxes, all those different things is, it's really encouraging to see that continued commitment to tax reform by all of these leaders. That's exactly right. And I, 
I, I think from the, the spirit of, of, of all three uh, speakers, you, you had that sense that they're serious about this and want to keep going, whether it's income or property. Yeah. Um, so moving on, we had um, Director Paulson come on from Department of Revenue and Department of Management, former House Speaker, was uh, my leader as a legislator for the first seven years that I was at the Capitol, two years as minority leader and five years as speaker. And uh, Director Paulson has, is very gifted at stating things clearly and factually and doing it in a way that's unassailable. And he's doing this today. And I heard a couple people were a little concerned. Well, it's, you know, going to talk about how the Department of Management calculates <laughs> numbers. And, it, you know, as, as exciting as an hour's worth of tax policy can be. But actually, if you, if you listen to what Director Paulson had to say, it's, it's critical because you understand exactly where we're at and how all these things are possible. And so I'm going to play that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of the... Uh, the pieces of information here that, that, he, that he gives and why it is so important. So the governor's proposed budget that they're working right now, the recommendation was to spend just under eight and a half billion dollars uh, this year. Some of this is government math and since we don't have that much time, I won't explain it all to you. But actually what is available to be spent uh, because of carry forwards is actually about $10.4 billion, okay? And so her proposal is spending at just under 82% of the available resources. I will tell you, this is, what's, this is what makes this work as the tax rates come down and you keep that spending low and they're going, those lines are gonna come closer together. But at least right now I would project they do, not, they do not cross and so there is going to be some opportunities. But again, that takes great, great discipline on uh, everybody's fault, uh, everybody's part. So there's actually three things here that I want to I want to highlight. First of all, this idea of available revenue. So there's some extra money in the budget and, and Director Paulson mentions carry forwards. The way LSA, we talk about a 99% expenditure limitation. I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds on this. There's a difference between available revenue and ongoing <clears throat> revenue. So there's about 10 point... Uh, I think he said $10.2, $10.4 billion of available revenue. So under the 99% expenditure limitation, the legislature could grow that budget enormously and fill that amount of available revenue. But the ongoing revenue number is a little bit less than that. Actually, it's a fair amount less than that. But by either measure, the governor's proposed budget is only 82% of, of available revenue. It's incredibly restrained and not spending those dollars. And, and that's a that's an, a critical piece. And, and as Director Paulson says, that is the foundation for being able to extend tax cuts. And, and one of the things that we'd like to see local governments kind of do the same thing, right? They don't need to just spend it all when they get these windfall amounts. They, they you know, they're welcome to restrain their own spending. We'd, we'd encourage them to do that. But that's, a, that's an important point. And further, he talks about the lines crossing, John. And and I think this is something that we've talked about in other ways. But, and again, how it all fits together, Leader Whitver is going to come back to this in a minute. The lines crossing means is that even with the reductions in revenue, which will come from the previous tax cuts, is that those lines still don't cross. The state will still have enough money in ongoing revenue to meet all of their obligations as they're currently projected. Did that make sense? It did, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, <you're, laughs> it, it does get complicated, yeah. but uh, I think Director Paulson hit, you know, made the, the key point in, is that uh, in order to have tax relief, you have to have limited spending. And that's exactly what Governor Reynolds has done and, and why, you know, she was given the highest ranking by Cato uh, in their fiscal report card on, on America's governors. And, and really, it, it, whether you're looking at income taxes, property taxes, 
uh, if you don't control spending, it's going to be hard to provide tax relief or to lower tax rates. And so, I mean, Director Paulson also uh, provided an overview of the budget that was, I think, really good for people to hear because, for example, I bet a lot of people don't know that we spend 56% of our budget on education, and we always hear arguments that education isn't fully funded. Yeah. And so majority of that budget is going to, uh, the general fund budget is going to education and also uh, 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 Medicaid. And, and uh, you know, Director Paulson also pointed out, uh, uh, and I think they're going to update this study, but just quickly, that the cost of government in Iowa and, uh, is, is close to $40 billion. Yeah. And, and that's federal, state, and local. But that's, that's a lot. And he had a number, and if it's not right there, but th- it was stunning. So 40-some billion dollars in a population of 3.2 million yes. is a really big chunk yeah. of change for each man, woman, and child yeah. living and he, in the state of Iowa. And, of course, I wrote that down, but I can't yeah, we find didn't my bring, note. Yeah. <laughs> You usually come in with a whole page of notes, John, yes, but I yeah, guess I, yeah. I, I led you to believe that I was going to handle all that today. But it, it is, it's stunning. I'll link that that report in the comments mm-hmm. on the podcast below so you can uh, click to and, and and see it because it is really interesting. But and could I just say one more quick thing on that? Uh, and that's why I think what the governor is trying to do with this reorganization bill is so important is to streamline government and provide more efficiencies and savings. And, and like, and, you know, Director Paulson said, it's been over 40 years since last time this was seriously done. And so I think what the governor is trying to do is, is very good, very commendable. And, uh, cause it's, uh, it's very hard to address spending and, and they're, they're making it work without sacrificing the priorities of government. And Director Paulson mentions that, that it's all, the, the critical piece is the fiscal discipline that it's going to take to get there and continue to make it work. So um, moving on to closing the event yesterday was Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitver, who kind of kicked things off with an idea of where we've been, which, which I think is an important reminder. So I'm going to click this next. I would put what we have been able to accomplish over seven years against any other state in the entire country over that time period. After seven years, it's fun to look back at what we've been able to accomplish. And it's more fun after seven years because there's now tangible results. I think it's kind of funny. We debate all these big issues. And so often on the Senate floor or the House floor, you hear all kinds of extreme criticism about how this bill is going to ruin the state or this bill is going to bankrupt the state and all this hyperbole of what these bills are going to do to ruin Iowa. And it's one thing for a legislator to stand on the floor of the Senate or on the floor of the House and to make these claims. Now we're at seven years in and we can look back and see what those results actually are. And here's the results in Iowa. We have a record surplus, record low unemployment, $2.7 billion in the cash or on the taxpayer reserve fund now, record job openings ready to be filled. We are the strongest state going into COVID. We're the fastest recovery from COVID. And I would say that right now in Iowa, we're in the strongest position we have ever been in as a state. So yes, to all of that. The, the proof is in the results, John. That's right. And we, not only are we proud of that, I mean, going back to what Chris talked about at the outset of the event, it's about making our state stronger and our communities better. And it's working. It is. It yeah. just is. Yeah. So whatever doom and gloom and naysayers that, that, that come about. And so kudos to Leader Whit for, for just stating the facts. Yes. Look where yeah. we're at. Yeah. And it's a great reminder that we are on the right track. John, you you have come in the past with, with information about state-by-state state rankings and where we're at and where we're moving. But I, I agree with, with Leader Whitver. Is it's, it's incredibly exciting, and we are showcasing to the country mm-hmm. how it works. Yes. And it was it, yeah. we talked about Governor Reynolds being at Cato mm-hmm. and talking about how it's working and showcasing. That was our, yep. you know, the episode, Showcasing Iowa to the Nation. This is exactly it. It's the proof. It's the facts of where we've been and where we are now and yeah. how it's working. Yeah. Leader Whitver also talked about the tax reform last year, which uh, 
really was the most comprehensive, and you know Iowa led the way, and uh, you know, and that was a huge transformation going from nine bra- bracket progressive income tax to a flat tax, and then also, you know, as as he said, they're not done. They're not just going to la- leave it at three point nine. They're going to continue working on that. And so, one thing that's always impressed me with Leader Whitver is that he said we're not. You know, I've heard him say more than once, we're not going to waste our, the majority. We're going to do things. Yeah. And and he's delivered on that. Yeah. And and he's just been a pillar of of sound conservative policy and, you know, fighting for those principles. And, and that's what really is making Iowa a good place. I'm, I'm biased because uh, Leader Whitver is, is my friend. But I b- also believe that there is no legislator— who is more directly responsible for putting the wins on Governor Reynolds' desk? Yes, than Leader yeah, Jack. Yeah, I, I agree. And for him to go up and state this, I think is really powerful. Yeah, and and he gets it, and and it's why. And he mentioned other it, it, or all elsewhere in his comments about this is why he ran for office. Mm-hmm. He truly believes in these things. Yeah, and uh, it's encouraging to see him continue to to proclaim the wins. Uh, one last clip from Leader Whitver going back to the earlier idea of the what cities need to do and what they're asking for. We only have so much money at the state level, and every dollar we bail out the locals on property tax, we can't cut our income tax rate even further. And so if we're at 3.9 now, the goal should be zero. Short and sweet there, but he states the goal. No, the, the cities don't need any more backfill money. They don't need any more buy-downs. Because we're, we're doing this thing with the state dollars already. They're on the path yeah. to zero. And it goes back to what Chairman Kaufman said. We're not done yet. That's right. So kudos to them for getting up and talking about all their yeah. wins. But these folks just want to keep going. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, go ahead. There's, there's a temptation. And we, we saw, and thankfully, those amendments were def- uh, defeated. But uh, there's a temptation to basically say, in order to do property tax relief, we need to transfer more to the state general fund, which uh, does not necessarily, and other states have shown that doesn't work. And and so, uh, Leader Whitver is absolutely correct in saying that. And and so the the uh, solution is not to assume more obligations from the locals, but have them control their spending, just like what the legislature has done and what Governor Reynolds has done, and. And they're demonstrating that yes, you can you can still fund the priorities of government. You can still lower tax rates, and the localities need to start learning that as well. And it it may make some hard decisions, but that's that's what elected officials are there for. I, a, a couple kind of closing thoughts that come to mind is that it's not usually like this in a lot of places. It's very easy, in fact, maybe the easiest thing as an elected official is to take some taxpayer money and throw it at a problem or throw it at a political issue, spend some more, give a credit, and claim a win in the the name of continuing to hold on to power. And that's really not what they're doing here. They're truly trying to restrain this spending to make Iowa better. They don't rest once they get a win, much like our organization was challenged by our board to look at what's next after yes. the income tax bill, I, I get the sense that these policymakers are asking themselves the very same question, what's next? And I mean, long may it continue. May they continue to have that spirit of, of this enterprise that we're on of trying to make Iowa the shining example across the country. And Now, I know from my time in legislature and in leadership, in talking with leaders from other states, and you've done a lot of that in other think tanks around the country, it is a very rare thing to have this level of cooperation and shared sense of purpose inside a legislature and 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 a governor that they, look, they are going to have disagreements. It is the very nature Mm -hmm. of the way our the way our system of government is structured and it's a feature not a bug they should disagree they should hash things out but they have this common sense of what we're trying to accomplish and it is it is an incredibly amazing thing to watch and it's hard to truly communicate to Iowans 
how unique that is and how much of it, how much it's going to set the stage for generations to come of what Iowa looks like. That's right. And, you know, we still have people from other states contacting us, asking us, how did you guys do tax reform? How did you do the school choice bill? Yeah. Because it's, uh, you know, and then they're talking about some other policies as well, but these are, these are historic achievements that other states are trying to do and struggling to do it. Yeah. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could claim credit for all these wins here as an organization, and we're not going to do it. I think we play an important role in it, mm -hmm. much like the average Iowan plays yeah. a role in electing these folks and supporting them and contacting their legislator. And, and we do our part in providing information and encouragement, but we give full credit to the folks that yeah. are in the trenches getting this done. Yeah, it and comes it down all to, works together. Yeah, and it comes down to leadership. And, you know, I think that's one thing about um, the legislature and the governor, but especially um, Leader Whitver and Governor Reynolds have have really been pillars of good conservative policy. Yep. You know, and, and it's and that's one frustrating thing for me is even how much good press that someone like Ron DeSantis is getting, you know, it's a shame that I was often bypassed because we're such a small state. Yeah. But really we're as you as you said, we're doing some great things and as Leader Whitver said, we you know Iowa has really set the example for a lot of issues. Well, you're right, John. I think sometimes we do get overlooked, although I think that's changing. And I think more and more of our counterparts across the country are starting to ask us that question. Mm -hmm. You're seeing our governor going out on the national stage as, as the chair of the Republican Governors yes, Association yeah. and really starting to tell that story. And I, and I think much like Leader Whitver's explanation of where we're at and how we got here, at some point, as we elevate nationally, it is going to be next to impossible to ignore yeah. how Iowa has done what they've done and and what the future holds. So I'm I, here for all of it. Are you? I am. Yes. Yeah. You're not a yeah. native Iowan. No. John, no, but, but it's got to be exciting, <laughs> yeah, right? It is. You're yeah, part of yeah, it, too. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, we are way over time, but we actually did have a couple of the... Uh, podcast fans that told us it was okay to go over time every once in a while. And they the, liked the content. You know, so. when you announced the podcast, uh, there was a round of applause. Right. So, yeah, we, well, yeah. we met the 12th yeah, listener. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you, you are, you are sort of like yeah. the old school yeah. ITR live podcast. Yeah. If you can lay claim to be in the 12th listener yeah. and, and we met him at the event yesterday. Yeah. So yeah, it's great. But <laughs> Uh, to that end, don't forget to share this. I, there's a lot of folks I know that wanted to be at tax day that didn't have a chance to get there. So this is a chance to at least, uh, hear the highlights, uh, of what went on and, and a little uh, taste of how these things actually get accomplished. And so we want to continue to try and showcase that, share the podcast, this episode, the entire show with your friends and your neighbors and everyone you know, we're hearing especially on the ITR local and the the property tax work that we're doing is there's a lot of new folks out there that are hungry for this information. So Can please, I, yeah, go ahead, John. I just want to make one more closing comment. I wish that you would play your closing comments from tax day because they were they they summed up exactly what we need to do on the property tax well, front. I, I could so. have done that, John. I figure I get the whole podcast to yeah, talk. Yeah. It's a little self serving to just run are, run highlights good. of yourself. You those know? are great comments. Though. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, John. But you know, I'll try and I'll maybe I'll summarize them uh, another time. But anyway, well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of all of this and everyone's role in making Iowa a fantastic place to be. And with that, we will see you next time on ITR Live.